Good afternoon, everyone. Our apologies for the delay. Welcome to today's update on COVID-19 in Alberta. With us, as always, is Dr. Dina Hinshaw, Chief Medical Officer of Health for Alberta. Dr. Hinshaw will provide brief remarks, and then we will open the floor to questions. Thank you, Tom. Good afternoon. Today, I am pleased to report that 6,218 Albertans have recovered from COVID-19, leaving 612 active cases in the province. Currently, 55 people are hospitalized with COVID-19, with four of these in ICUs. In the last 24 hours, out of 3,754 new tests, there were 22 new cases. I am pleased to say that there are no new deaths today, and in today's outbreak web posting, several outbreaks have now ended, including the Horizon Work Camp and Manoir du Lac. I want to acknowledge the work of local teams in stopping spread in these outbreaks, and in particular, want to note that using lessons learned from Curl Lake and with significant effort from the company, the Horizon Work Camp outbreak was kept to only five cases. With today's test results, we have now surpassed 250,000 COVID tests in Alberta. This is a remarkable achievement and a testament to the tireless efforts of our public health system from our lab technicians and contact tracers to the public health nurses and those working at assessment centers. Strategic testing is essential to Alberta's relaunch. Over the past couple of weeks, our daily volume has ranged between 2,000 and 4,000 tests per day. We have the capacity to do more. And in preparation for stage two of our relaunch, now is an opportune time to expand testing to get a full understanding of the presence of COVID-19 in our population. This is why, effective immediately, we are expanding testing to include anyone in Alberta, whether they have COVID-19 symptoms or not. This will help provide data to further understand the impacts of moving to stage two of Alberta's relaunch strategy. Expanded testing will also help us understand where there might be undetected positive cases and therefore prevent further spread of the virus. If you were worried that you might have been exposed to COVID-19, even if you were feeling well and aren't showing symptoms, I encourage you to arrange for testing by completing the online assessment tool to book your appointment online. This can happen in Calgary immediately and next week, this booking appointments online will be live across the province. No matter where you live, you can go online effective today to arrange for an appointment for testing. Please be patient as Alberta Health Service implements this province-wide asymptomatic testing. Everyone who wants a test will be able to access one, but priority will continue to be given to symptomatic individuals and close contacts of known COVID cases. As we continue through relaunch, we must remember the virus is still with us and we must still prevent the spread. As businesses and facilities continue to reopen, we must continue to prioritize the health of the most vulnerable of our community members. This includes Calgary and Brooks, where Albertans in these two cities have been patient as we took a measured, phased approach to the first stage of their relaunch, because taking this extra time allowed us to monitor any spread from ongoing, from opening businesses and other stage one activities in Calgary and Brooks, where baseline rates were higher when we began stage one. I would like to congratulate residents of these cities on the downward trend in their numbers, which has not been seen in most places around the world where relaunch has happened. I am pleased to say that thanks to these numbers, the final stage of phase one will begin in these cities on Monday. This means day camps and summer schools may open with occupancy limits and places of worship may resume in-person services greater than 15 people with precautions to limit the potential spread of infection. Public health orders limit occupancy at places of worship to one third of the building's capacity to a maximum of no more than 50 people based on lessons learned from outbreaks in faith communities in Alberta and around the world. Faith leaders must take steps to prevent the risk of transmission among staff, volunteers and members of the public who enter their space. Expanded guidance for places of worship is available on our BizConnect website. I also committed to posting guidance for organized outdoor sports and recreation applicable for stage one across the province. 
I know many people are eager to get outside with their teammates and play their favorite sport. But organized sports events, games, and leagues pre present a high risk of transmission and are not yet permitted in Stage 1. Non-contact outdoor activities can proceed with measures in place to limit the spread of the risk of transmission. Examples of such activities are running in physically distanced groups, singles tennis, and badminton or skateboarding. Activities like soccer, football, or martial arts are not permitted in Stage 1 unless organizers can modify practicing the components of these activities to meet public health orders and physical distancing requirements, such as a focus on individual drills rather than on team play. If you were looking to plan outdoor sports or other physical activities in the next few weeks, please refer to the guidance posted online. We will soon be at the three-month mark since our first case was identified. Albertans have done a tremendous job pulling together, supporting each other, and protecting each other by following public health orders. I know that we are all tired of COVID-19. We are tired of the impact the restrictions are having on our lives. And I wonder sometimes if asking Albertans to wash their hands one more time feels like nails on a chalkboard at this point. The trouble is that the virus has not disappeared. We are learning to live with it in a way that keeps the most vulnerable members of our community safe. And so it is important that we all continue to do our part by looking out for each other as we open activities back up. I am confident we can continue to work together to keep each other safe as we take additional steps along our relaunch path. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions. All right, we'll go to the phone now. Operator, could you put through the first caller, please? Yes, thank you. The first question is from Janet French of CBC. Please go ahead. Hi there, thanks for taking my question. I just uh, wanted to know a little bit about the single site rule uh, for healthcare workers in long-term care. I understand that that limitation doesn't apply to people who work in other settings such as hospitals or fast food restaurants, um, which would be places that they might have interaction with the public or sort of large numbers of other people. Do you think that the existing order is broad enough to prevent workers from bringing pathogens into long-term care homes? And if so, why? So when we instituted the single site rule, we looked at the evidence of where we were seeing introduction of COVID-19 into facilities. And one of the problems that we saw was the introduction of COVID-19 from one facility that had an outbreak into another facility where the workers were moving back and forth. Uh, we haven't seen that same issue happening with workers who work outside in other sites, as you mentioned, such as acute care. Uh, we do encourage workers to, uh, again, focus the, the time that they work um, as much as possible into that single long-term care site. But the decision was really based on the evidence and the epidemiology with respect to where we saw the, the risk of that, of that transmission happening. And so um, if we did see additional concerns, certainly we continue to look at the evidence. We continue to monitor and, and determine whether or not uh, we need to make additional adjustments or changes, but to date uh, the changes that have been made seem to have been successful in preventing that spread of outbreaks from one facility to the next. Operator, can you put through the next question, please? Yes, the next question is from James Keller, Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Hi there. Uh, can you tell us, in terms of the, uh, the public health emergency and the timing of it ending, um, can you tell us what advice you provided to the government about when or if that declaration should end? And are there any tools that you get from that uh, declaration that you will not have your disposal now uh, once it's over? So uh, the declaration of public health emergency is the decision of government. And with respect to advice, I think it's, it's looking at the uh, ways that we implement the measures that we need to take to protect people from, people from COVID. We don't need the declaration of a public health emergency to protect people from COVID. We do have tools, uh, some tools with the declaration of the emergency and, and other tools that we can use uh, outside of that declaration. So whether or not that public health emergency is maintained, uh, it, we will still be able to, and we absolutely still will be able to respond to COVID-19 and protect Albertans. 
So the emergency really um, is a, a measure that uh, allows a, a significant and rapid response, but it doesn't, if, if that measure is ended, we still are able to respond and we do have other tools that we can use uh, to, to do that. So with respect to the tools as a Chief Medical Officer of Health, um, for the, the things that I would need to do, uh, those are not particularly linked to that declaration of a state of public health emergency. Operator, can you put through the next question, please? Thank you, Jason Herring, Calgary Herald. Hi, Dr. Henshaw. Uh, many businesses in Calgary, uh, including restaurants and barber shops, obviously reopened this week. Uh, we're seeing a lot of demand and traffic to those businesses locally. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of Albertans getting out into public spaces like parks again. Uh, I'm wondering from your view, how well are Albertans doing at staying safe and respecting public health restrictions while resuming these activities? So we keep a close watch on the complaints that come in to Alberta Health Services with respect to the public health orders and where concerns are being flagged where businesses or individuals aren't following those orders. And there has not been a significant increase in the number of orders that have come in to that online portal uh, over the last few weeks. So I'm sure like anything else, uh, there will be a small group of people who are um, perhaps uh, really excited to be out and about and, and perhaps again sometimes we're the victim of our own success given that we have managed to lower the rate of virus in the province uh, that people may forget about the importance but I think the majority of Albertans remember that we continue to be in a need to respond uh, to the pandemic in a way that protects each other and so again the, the metrics that I have available to me really are that complaints which doesn't seem to have increased uh, and again, my, my uh, close monitoring of the numbers, which also are continuing to be quite stable and even trend downward slightly. Operator, can you put through the next question, please? Yes, thank you. Julia Wong, Global News. Hi, Dr. Henshaw. A couple of weeks ago, you said testing those with no known exposure is more likely to lead to false positives. You've also said that testing many asymptomatic people isn't necessary to move out of this pandemic, and also that testing broadly across the province is unlikely to yield a lot of good clinical information. Now that the province is expanding testing, what precautions are in place when it comes to false positives, and what new clinical information are you expecting to find by testing broadly, or is this more about using the lab capacity that has been built? So we have four key goals uh, for using lab capacity. The first one is uh, case identification. Uh, the second one is the identification of, of close contacts, contact tracing in a, a very rapid way. The third is rapid outbreak detection and uh, management and control. And the fourth is population surveillance. And so with respect to expanding testing across the province, uh, the anticipation would be that there wouldn't be a great deal of individual case identification uh, beyond uh, the, the focused efforts that we've been doing already. However, what it does do for us is that fourth goal of population surveillance. And what it does is it allows us to get a really good understanding of the presence of the virus in our communities in places where our current testing or our previous testing framework um, was focused on those who are at highest risk of exposure. And this current testing framework, again, is really focused on that population surveillance and our ability to take the next few weeks, uh, do this expanded testing, and make sure that uh, we have that full population picture as we anticipate our move into relaunch within the next few weeks. So with respect to false positives, it is potentially a concern that um, if you do test a large number of people who have a very low uh, pre-test probability of having COVID uh, that you could get some false positives but uh, it's also true that the test is is quite specific and so the number overall of false positives would be anticipated um, as a proportion of the positive test results we would still continue to investigate each positive result uh, given that we are needing to be cautious uh, however, again, the important thing to know is that this particular testing expansion will allow us to uh, meet that fourth goal of population surveillance in a robust way and will give us really good information as we prepare for stage two of relaunch. Operator, can you put through the next caller, please? Chris Epp, CTV. 
Thank you, Dr. Hinshaw. Just curious, that I know the contact tracing app doesn't even register someone unless they're exposed in close proximity to, to infection for 15 minutes or so. So given that, why are team sports still being um, not allowed to play, given that in many cases, such as football and hockey, you're wearing full equipment, you're wearing gloves, hockey may wear a full face shield, and your contact with other people's quite fleeting, like a matter of seconds, we're actually very close to each other. So there's two components of close contact that are important when we're considering uh, whether or not someone might have been exposed to the virus. One is the duration of time that someone's in contact. And the AB Trace Together app records cumulative exposure um, with that cutoff of 15 minutes, but it is cumulative exposure over a period of 24 hours. So if you have uh, a minute or two of exposure to somebody uh, that adds up to 15 minutes within 24 hours, you still would be considered a close contact. But the other component of determining whether or not someone is a close contact is the nature of the exposure. And so if someone were to be within two meters of someone else and cough or sneeze, uh, or, for example, if uh, they're um, exerting themselves, so if they're playing a sport and they're breathing really heavily and they come into close contact with somebody, you wouldn't necessarily need that full 15 minutes to have a risk of exposure. So the app really detects one component of exposure, uh, but the, it's not possible for any kind of electronic app to detect the nature of an exposure. And it's that kind of high-risk exposure from sports and physical exertion that in this stage, in, in stage one, where we continue to be cautious with respect to limiting the, the close contact between people, uh, that we are continuing to say that that close contact needs to be avoided at this time. Again, because physical exertion does increase that risk of when people are breathing heavily and we've seen instances of very large outbreaks globally from uh, things such as fitness classes that are happening with large groups of people indoors who are working out a high intensity workout. And so we can see that that, that kind of activity does bring risk. Operator, can you put through the next question, please? Yes, Ravi Bujakanian, CBC. Hi, Dr. Hinshaw. A couple of days ago in the legislature, Premier Kenny suggested that he is challenging public health experts to figure out how to create a wall of defense around seniors and the most vulnerable as we move to the next stages of Alberta's economic relaunch. I'm wondering, what does that mean for you? So part of that wall of defense is the work that we've done with operators of congregate care sites to uh, introduce many measures to protect seniors who live in those congregate care sites. And that includes things like uh, ensuring that we have rapid response teams available in AHS uh, who at the first moment that anyone in those sites has any symptoms that operators can call and get access to very quick testing and then as soon as there is any kind of positive test result that immediate outbreak measures are put in place and one step before that all the measures that are put in place to prevent the introduction of virus into those communities so including daily screening of staff uh, restrictions on the ability of visitors particularly visitors within facility we have introduced outdoor visits for the last several weeks uh, given that there's reduced risk of transmission in outdoor settings and also that that uh, limits the concerns about potential um, infection spread through surface contact. So I think the, the additional measures that uh, I think we're, we're considering are what types of advice we might be able to provide to seniors living in the community who aren't a part of these congregate settings, but providing them with additional information about how they can assess their own risk and the risk of different activities in their community and how we can support uh, other seniors outside of these congregate care settings and uh, those who have chronic medical conditions, whatever age they may be, so that we can provide them with the best advice and supports to make sure that they have that information to be able to stay safe. Operator, can you put through the next question, please? Kevin Nimick, CTV. Hi, Dr. Henshaw. You announced expanded testing earlier for anyone who wants one. Uh, to be clear, does this mean residents can now have unlimited tests? Could I be tested every day or every second day if I wanted to be? 
we know this is a condition of the NHL setting up shop in Alberta, so that players could be tested often. So will regular people have the same access to tests as hockey players? So uh, there is no restriction on the frequency with which people can access testing. So that's uh, not something that that would limit people's access. Again, I think the the recommendation would be that testing should never be used as a replacement for public health measures because what we know is that a negative test is a point in time snapshot uh, and so it doesn't predict uh, what may happen if someone has been exposed and has a known exposure they still need to be uh, in isolation for 14 days and a negative test result on day one or two or three does not change the the need for that quarantine period so absolutely you know they, there is no difference between the access that Albertans have for testing in the next several weeks with access that the NHL may have. However, I want to reiterate that the access um, that was being planned for the NHL was through private pay options. And so there was never intended to be a differential uh, public access to testing for any group. All right, I think we've got time for two more questions. Operator, could you put through the next one, please? Dylan Short, The Edmonton Journal. Hi, Dr. Hinshaw. I was wondering if um, you've had any discussions around loosening restrictions on visitors to hospitals. I know that we are now doing some of the elective and non-emergency surgeries, and I've heard people are wondering if, when they may be able to visit people for non-COVID issues in hospitals. So I've had lots of those questions about visitors both to hospitals and visitors to continuing care, and I absolutely recognize that not being able to visit loved ones, whether they're in hospital or in continuing care facilities, is a significant challenge, both for the individual who's either in hospital or in the facility and for their family members or close friends. Uh, so that is something that I've had some conversations with Alberta Health Services about. The AHS visitor policy is an uh, uh, organizational policy uh, that is based on the continuing care restrictions that are in place under my orders. And so it's something that uh, is being looked at. We do need to balance the risk of introduction of virus against the need for people to have support from their loved ones particularly in hospital in what's a very difficult time. Uh, and of course, for residents of continuing care, having the ability to have social connection is an important part of their health. So we continue to have discussions and, and try to weigh out all of the, the interests and particularly with residents of continuing care, uh, it's not something that's an, an easy decision to make because those people are the most vulnerable to severe outcomes. And so we do need to be very mindful of that when we're considering visitor restrictions. Small point of clarification before we go to our final question. There are currently 616 active cases and there were 24 new cases identified today. Operator, could you put through the final question, please? Yes, the final question is from Michael King, uh, Michael King, Global TV. Please go ahead. Hi there, Dr. Hinshaw. Um, one quick uh, update if we can. Anything on the date for stage two? And then also just looking at hospitalizations, we see that those are actually up. I think there's 55 today, so that'd be up 10 in the last four days. Is that a concerning increase? So the date of the stage two is something that will be discussed next week. And so a final decision has not yet been made. I've said before that given the, the low new case numbers that we've been seeing, the really encouraging results from our stage one relaunch, uh, that we are considering whether or not we can advance the date of stage two but again a final decision won't be made until next week uh, with respect to the hospitalizations there has been an increase in the last few days hospitalizations are a function not only of our total cases but also of who it is that is exposed and is infected with the virus so those who are older who have uh, medical conditions are at higher risk of having more severe illness and needing hospital care. It's something that we're watching very closely, uh, but at this point, we haven't seen uh, an uptick in our total number of cases, and we'll continue to watch both total cases and hospitalizations closely, but at this point, uh, I don't anticipate that this, what's happened in the last few days would change our discussions regarding relaunch. Again, we'll continue to watch that closely, and if the situation changes, that will always be factored into decisions going forward. All right, thank you for joining us, everyone. We will provide another update on Monday afternoon. Have a safe weekend.